And thanks to everyone for being here and for your lovely um, introductions in the chat box. It's already lifting my mind up to realize we have people from England and all across um, Europe, but also in America and in Singapore, in Malaysia. So that's just so wonderful. And one of the real beauties, isn't it, of the Zoom um, forum. And yeah, you're very welcome to have the, your settings on speaker view, but I always find it so beautiful to be able to see everybody's face and just tap into that sense of mutual support that we provide for each other. It's just extremely uplifting and inspiring to think that so many of us, out of all the things you could have chosen to do, you've chosen to be here and you've chosen to practice for the whole day. Yeah. Probably a lot of you know me, so you also understand that you'll get a nice long break in the middle. So we'll have two hour sessions sort of from, well, actually, I'll give you some walking meditation, but you'll get at least an hour and a half for your lunch and for some resting meditation as well, because these are all different modes of practice that help us to soften and rest, restore and encourage these beautiful mind states, beautiful qualities and also beautiful perceptions in the mind. So this whole path can be seen in a sense as a training in wholesome perceptions, perceptions that actually increase the positive, wholesome, um, beneficial qualities of mind and of heart and start to undermine our tendency towards um, qualities and experiences in our minds, which only lead us to suffering. It's so easy to say they're bad or they're unwholesome, but they're unwholesome only in the sense that they lead us to um, more suffering and create suffering, of course, for others as well. So this is the Buddha's whole intention, you know, his whole um, purpose is to discuss suffering, the cause of suffering, and then, of course, the way to eradicate that cause and the path to train towards full awakening, full awakening from, you know, unwholesome, um, unhelpful qualities of mind and to learn to use our perception in ways that is for our benefit rather than for our harm, yeah. And it's really beautiful in the Buddha's teachings because he always makes it clear that we have to use a kind of threefold reasoning method um, to reflect upon our conduct. Is it beneficial to me or does it cause affliction? Is it beneficial for others or does it cause affliction for others, suffering, pain? And is it beneficial for both? And so, of course, we're looking for things that are beneficial to all beings, yeah? everyone you come into contact with. And the beauty is that most of the time what's beneficial to us is also beneficial to others. If you have a lot of love and kindness in your heart, you know, if you develop qualities of patience, forgiveness, um, gentleness, then that's going to benefit everyone around you. Yeah? If we can't forgive others. It's as though we just get stuck on their faults. You know, we can only see one aspect of that person or one deed, maybe a very big mistake that that person did or a way that they really harmed you. But we become blind then to their other qualities or even just to the situation they were in, the struggles that they were going through at that time that led to that unwholesome, harmful behavior. So it really clouds and obscures the mind when we're only able to perceive things in one way. And... Um, I think, you know, in the West, we're so conditioned to look for what's wrong, maybe all over the world, but certainly in sort of Western education systems, we're considered smart and clever if we can like critique um, theories or particular um, things that we're taught in school. You know, the whole idea is to be um, analytical and discerning, which is wonderful. But I think it's like the Dalai Lama says, he, he says, we spend so much time um, cultivating the head, cultivating the brain, but not enough time cultivating our heart, cultivating the qualities in our heart. So a beautiful mind is not really so much about what we know or how well we can argue and reason. It's more about developing these beautiful qualities. Um, a beautiful mind is also a mind that's grateful. So life doesn't have to be perfect. It's not that we um, necessarily need beautiful situations, beautiful sensory objects or um, conditions around us. It's more about being able to tune into the blessings in our life, to what is going well, to what we do have going for us. Yeah. Quite in, um, surprisingly to me, I had my COVID vaccine, I think a couple of weeks ago now or a week and a half ago. 
and I didn't have a lot of anticipation for it. I just thought, yeah, it's good. You know, the vaccines are coming along. Maybe they work, maybe they don't work. Um, there's this very small chance of side effects, whatever. And I was actually in quite a, a miserable mood that morning for various reasons, feeling really tired and kind of all the admin work and the work of my project getting on top of me. And I went for this vaccine, just breezed in, breezed out. <laughs> These very kind ladies just, you know, gave me the vaccine. It took a couple of seconds. And from then on, I was overcome with this amazing sense of joy and gratitude, a real sense of lightness. I thought, gosh, what is this? Is it something they've put in the vaccine? Like, is it the antibodies? Maybe it's all the care, all the love that went in there. But I think on reflection, it was just a feeling of um, real gratitude, perhaps even heightened by the fact that so many other people, especially at this time in India, in Brazil, are suffering intensively, you know, with the lack of oxygen and with very little prospect of uh, being vaccinated, you know, en masse. And uh, it was really interesting how I could hold both realities and yet tune into the positive in a way that didn't diminish the suffering of others in a less fortunate position, but actually made me motivated to make best use of the privileges that I have um, and to recognize that this isn't something I've earned or something I deserve. This is just by virtue of being, you know, in the culture I'm in, in the country I'm in, um, and all the incredible hard work of the scientists, the NHS and the healthcare providers, all those volunteers who took risks in the trials, some people even volunteering to actually catch the COVID virus, like to voluntarily um, give themselves COVID in order to, you know, have the scientists um, experiment the efficacy of the vaccine on them. And, just this real sense of uplift arose, which is quite different to feeling guilty, thinking, oh, it's really wrong, I shouldn't be getting this, other people can't have it. That doesn't really beautify the mind or encourage us, I think, to do good with what we have. It's much wiser to actually recognise the benefits, the privileges we have, and to realise that, yeah, we can use those privileges, that position, you know, of hopefully being... Um, at least more invulnerable to the virus to carry on going out and, and, and giving what I can in this world. Yeah. So it was a very beautiful um, experience for me. And it just reminded me of coming in contact with the Dhamma as well in my twenties, when I was 20. And um, this incredible sense of gratitude, knowing that the retreat had been made available through the generosity of those who benefited before me because in that particular tradition, there was never any charge for the teachings. It was all on a donation basis. And you would only donate if you completed the retreat and if you had found benefit in the teaching. So I knew that there were countless unknown people who'd contributed, maybe some people with very little money, maybe others who had a bit more and everybody had contributed towards me being able to receive this invaluable gift of the Dhamma teachings, you know, in my early twenties. And uh, my teacher used to say, two, there are two qualities uh, that should be developing if you're really practicing the path. One is a feeling of gratitude, and the other is a feeling to serve others without expecting anything in return. So this was kind of instilled in me from the beginning. And luckily in that system, it was the Goenka um, tradition. They really encouraged service as a way of giving they would say, you know, it's even more um, valuable than giving a donation. In fact, infinitely more valuable. Because when you give a donation, it's a beautiful thing to do. You know, you're, again, enabling other people to contact these teachings. But you only have the volition to give once. And then, of course, while you're giving, you might experience the joy of giving. And on reflection afterwards, you can gain a lot of happiness from that. But when you serve in a retreat for 10 days, from the morning, the moment you wake up, you're thinking about the retreatants, you're thinking about you know, how to serve them, um, how to make sure everyone's in the hall and that they're looked after, that the conditions are conducive. And you're there for people you know, from 4.30 in the morning until nine at night. So imagine how many beautiful intentions you're developing during that period. And this starts to really purify and brighten up the mind. 
even if at the time, I mean, sometimes I would feel very tired, you know, um, but the benefit of seeing all these people go through the process that I'd been through that had changed my life would just give me joy that carried me really for the first 10 years, I would say, of my practice life. You know, it was just one of the best periods of my life, seeing all these people come to the Dhamma and leave with the same benefits that I'd experienced. I just felt so uplifted by that, you know, and I know that whatever I was doing was very small. It was the efforts of so many people. But all of us here are part of a community, you know, who are trying to serve in the best ways we can. Our livelihoods are a type of service as well, right? Even if it's not directly um, classed as Dhamma service, everything we do can be seen as an aspect of virtue, an aspect of performing wholesome actions, not only abstaining from harm, but performing the positive yeah, and encouraging others to do the same. So the Buddha says with virtue, you know, we should not only restrain ourselves and refrain from harmful actions, but we should pure, um, we should perform, we should promote um, beautiful speech, for example, beautiful um, conduct of body, speech and mind, and also encourage others to do the same. And finally, to speak in praise of others who do that. So we're kind of, uh, <laughs> sounds like advertising, doesn't it? <laughs> but we're just, you know, pointing these things out to people and enabling them to say, oh, yeah, that's true. You know, when somebody does something good, it benefits them, it benefits me, and it's nice to think about it. So I wanted to talk a bit about how these qualities prepare our minds for meditation, because a lot of the time, I think, in meditation circles, which are sort of focus more on the retreat situation, we often turn up a little bit scattered, a little bit all over the place. You know, we haven't necessarily put the preparations in place and we might think, oh, I'm hopeless at meditating. You know, I can never settle my mind. But the thing is, unless you are actually cultivating um, qualities of contentment, of simplicity, patience, um, giving people the benefit of the doubt, you know, soft qualities of the heart in your everyday life, then of course, how can you expect to go sit down and develop them there and then? We have to continuously see our whole life as part of the practice. And by doing so, we're actually training ourselves um, to have the correct approach to practice. So in a sense, this whole Eightfold Path starts with wise perspective, yeah, sometimes called right view, but I really like the word um, wise perspective, because basically it involves understanding that there is suffering in this world, that nobody is immune from that suffering. Yeah. We're all going to encounter various types, various intensities from time to time whether we're privileged or less privileged in various ways, whether we're marginalized in some aspects of our lives and, and privileged in others. Um, this is the external situation we find ourselves in. And I do think it's important to work towards a fairer society, you know, to get involved, if you wish, in social justice causes. But then on the other side, you know, even people who seem to have everything going smoothly in their life, all the advantages, a good job, a good house, family, you know, all the material needs met, we still encounter suffering from time to time. And in my teens, I got quite depressed because I was someone who had everything going for me. And it almost felt as though because of that, people couldn't really understand why I would be suffering, why I would feel depressed. And that was quite shaming in a way for me because it was obvious that there was nothing much the external situation could do for me, right? I already had things pretty good, and yet there was this deep sort of sense of um, a lack of meaning and almost as though I could feel like the suffering of the world on my shoulders, which sounds so melodramatic. And, you know, maybe you could say that's hormonal or something, you know, when you're going through your teens. But it really did impact me to see the news, the way that people just, you know, fight for power and, and the way that greed motivates people and divides people and leads to all kinds of terrible wars. 
And so I felt this really heavily. Um, and it was very clear to me that suffering actually comes from inside. Um, so I wanted to find a way, you know, to understand that. Like, what is the purpose of this suffering? Because it's obviously part of life. But there must be a way to respond that will um, bring a sense of meaning to it and perhaps engender um, compassion in the heart. And I think this was a really great way to enter the practice, to really have this clear wish to understand the suffering and to find um, a way out, if you like, a path through and ultimately beyond that suffering. And from serving on these retreats as well, it became very clear that everybody has their own um, struggles, their own mental anguish, their fear, their um, you know, wrestling with their mind from time to time, maybe not living up to what they expect of themselves or what society expects from them. Um, and they all seem to go through like <clears throat> similar sort of phases in the retreats. You know, you'd be in there for like 10 days, 12 hours meditation every day. And it seemed like the retreats would go through certain phases and some would have their own quality. So some felt like, oh, there was a lot of sort of anger and heat sort of generated in this retreat. And it was as though we were all kind of on this journey with people that were basically strangers, but we were all going through it together. And it gave me the real clear sense that, you know, all beings are equal in this respect. Yeah. Suffering can be um, a great kind of equalizer in some ways in the sense that no matter what our situation, we still have to deal with loss. We still have to deal with, you know, aging, sickness and death. Um, obviously some of them are more supported. We have better sort of social support networks in place. We are more fin financially stable perhaps, but still, you know, anything that we have that we're basically going to be separated from becomes a source of, of sorrow and pain. In a way, the more attached we are, the more stable, the more we rely on those things, the harder it is to let them go. And they say, you know, for this reason, even the devas in the highest realms um, really suffer a lot when those realms fall apart. You know, you might believe in those sort of things or not. You might have an open mind towards it, but you can see it in your own heart. Sometimes we feel that everything's going just right. You know, we're on a real kind of we're surfing the wave so to speak and everything's going really well and you know we start to settle into that and then something happens that really jolts us and sometimes when we don't expect it it's even harder to deal with so having this sense of wise perspective can be really helpful and also motivate us to take care about our actions of body speech and mind and that's the other aspect important aspect of right view is an understanding that the quality of our intention does have effects that either lead to suffering for ourselves and others or lead to peace and happiness, wholesome kinds of happiness. So we do have some sort of ability to influence and to modify the suffering we encounter by the way, by the quality of our intention. And that's basically what karma means. It's a, it's the quality of our intention that then leads to actions of body and speech. Yeah. So our actions do have effects. And the more we become sensitive to that, the more care we can put into the way we use our minds, the way we um, show up in this world, the way we treat other people, especially those around us. And of course, if we can purify those um, intentions, they naturally um, increase and strengthen the next factor of the path, which is uh, right intention or right motivation. And the Buddha defines right motivation in three ways. So they're basically motivations of letting go, renunciation, nekkama sankapa, which sometimes gets a bit of a bad rap, I think, you know, letting go, I don't want to let go of the things I have. But after a while, we get a taste for it and we realize that actually having an open hand is much nicer than this grasping hand that becomes quite tight and mean. Yeah. One of the people in my um, community, because I do these regular teachings for quite a regular group of folks, um, talked about this seemingly very trivial incident, but I thought it was a great example. She said, um, yeah, her son's still living at home and they've got this deal that he sort of pays for his own food. 
but he kept eating her blueberries, you know, and she bought all these blueberries for her health. And uh, he kept sort of eating them and she could feel this sense of stinginess um, coming up, covetousness, you know, they're mine. <laughs> he should be buying them himself. But she recognised that this is quite an unwholesome um, type of reaction that's causing her a lot of suffering, right? And it's making her mind quite petty and tight. So with these blueberries, um, she decided to be more generous and she didn't only allow her son to have those blueberries, but she went and bought more. She went and bought as many as she could find, put them on the table and say, okay, come and eat the blueberries. <laughs> Which I think is really nice, isn't it? Because that's totally transforming stinginess into generosity. And that's really what this nekama means, like letting go um, is very, very close to giving, to generosity. Yeah? We give things up, we give things away, we give things to other people. Yeah, and we can bring that into our meditation in very beautiful ways. You know, you can sit to meditate and have the perception that this meditation is not for me. This meditation is in respect to the Buddha, in respect, out of respect to my teachers for all they've given me. You know, or it's for the sake of those who live with me. It's for the sake of a good friend. You know, I dedicate the blessings, the merits that I create through this practice to those in need. And so this is a kind of attitude of letting go, and it goes against um, sensory desire, basically. It's the antidote to sensory desire, to trying to find pleasure through the senses, which is never going to fully satisfy. And then the second uh, type of right motivation or right intention is um, loving kindness. So I'm putting these in their positive aspects. In uh, Pali, it's actually avyapada, which means non-ill will. And it's sometimes translated as loving kindness, sometimes as benevolence, which I think is very beautiful because we don't always feel warm and fuzzy, sort of lovey-dovey feelings, which anyway, metta is not. It can be accompanied by warmth and by a pleasant feeling, but not necessarily. But benevolence sort of is this attitude of may all beings be well, may they be happy, may they not be parted you know, from, from their gains. Uh, may they be protected and safe. You know, these kind of wishes that are very universal that you'd want for anybody, even those who are engaged in, you know, very unwholesome actions. Still, wouldn't the world be a better place if they could find peace inside? You know, if, if people are peaceful, if people do have purified motivations, it's not possible for them to cause harm intentionally to other people. So this loving kindness is, of course, an antidote to ill will and to all this whole sort of um, range of um, impurities of the mind which come under that category. So frustration, irritation, impatience. That's one of mine because <laughs> my mind wants to go kind of quite quickly. And sometimes, you know, through life, I have to just slow down and wait for things to come together. And that's a kind of ill will towards where we are right now. So loving kindness kind of expands and softens the mind and makes us much more accepting and embracing of this moment, of this situation, of the people around us. And then the last one is um, the right motivation of nonviolence, which can also be uh, interpreted as gentleness or non-harm. And gentleness also is related to patience, being kind of gentle with the moment rather than wanting to rush it on to something else. Yeah. Being non-harmful towards our mind, not trying to grab our awareness or grab our breath, but just having this very gentle touch that, you know, receives and even invites these beautiful states of mind inside. So we don't go out and grab them. We don't try to like force them. We just put the conditions in place and allow the results to manifest in their own time. So all these are ways of relating in life to each other, to our situations. They're also ways of relating to our emotional, our mental world. And as I say, to our meditation even to our meditation object, we can perceive that object almost like a little being that's come to visit and that we want to treat well, we want to treat with kindness and warmth rather than control. And they all soften the mind. They help to overcome what we call the five hindrances to meditation because they carry within them some of the antidotes, you know, loving kindness being the antidote to ill will, 
um, as I said, gentleness being the antidote to kind of um, impatience or restlessness. Yeah. Um, letting go is the antidote to sensual desire. So we actually can infuse our awareness with these qualities and that mindfulness then, that awareness becomes much more powerful, yeah? much softer and actually helps to purify the mind. And in the Eightfold Path, of course, these right motivations come before the sila, the virtue of body, speech and mind. Because as I say, if we're coming from a place of loving kindness, of non-harm, um, it becomes very difficult to speak words that are going to hurt another person. Yeah, we can only really do that when we're suffering, when we have ill will. And so they naturally ensue in virtue. And in that sense also, you can say that virtue is like a natural outcome of right perspective, wise perspective and wise motivation. I think the practice of virtue is incredibly rich um, in the relational field, you know, around other beings, but also within ourselves. And there's this beautiful aspect of virtue that um, is called sense restraint. And it's one that's not often really highlighted in many Buddhist teachings, but it's a really enormous part of the Eightfold Path. It's, it's very similar to right effort, because with sense restraint, what we're trying to do is learn to um, relate to the input at the sense doors, body, yeah, the body sense door, but also eyes, nose, ears, um, taste, and the mental um, sense door as well. We're learning to relate to it in a way that doesn't lead to unwholesome states increasing, but leads to the wholesome states increasing, and it undermines the unwholesome states. So out of all the perceptions we can have, we tend to always default to particular perceptions of others or of ourselves, of situations. But with sense restraint, we're actually learning to look at things in different ways, to focus on certain aspects of, say, a person that counter our initial response. So you might have someone in your life who triggers you in a certain way, um, and you've decided this person's too assertive or um, too controlling. And so whenever you see them, you know, even before you see them, this is the impression you have in your mind. And it's almost as though all your senses are looking for information, for feedback to confirm that hypothesis or that decision, that view of this person. And because of that, the mind's very rigid and unflexible. So what sense restraint does is it, it doesn't ignore that aspect that might be there, but it learns to look at that person in a different way. So you get a wider perspective and you can perhaps look at different qualities that counter that particular perception that's become so fixed. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's hard to see the opposite qualities, but you might be able to see that behind that sort of need to control or dominate, maybe there's an insecurity there. Maybe there's actually a tenderness, um, an uncertainty, a need to be in control. You know, maybe there's something happening in that person's life that's um, just causing them to be a little bit defensive or, um, and after a while you can kind of look at that person with eyes of compassion instead and start to notice that actually they too are, are much softer than they would appear. I noticed during my rains retreat last year that um, I was in England because I couldn't get to Australia to be with my teacher. And uh, that was like a sort of crisis in my monastic life. You know, we have these well, monastics have little crises too. <laughs> so it's like, how am I going to do this retreat just on my own without, you know, any support and without my teacher and my community that I, I really um, need to sort of get that nourishment with during that period at least um, and that usually gives me the strength and the sort of inspiration to carry on through the rest of the year with my project trying to establish this monastery in England which is pretty hard work so I couldn't get to, to Perth and I would just notice that there were so many things to be grateful for where I am you know it was the middle of the corona pandemic probably you know just after the worst period I would just look around me and think, you know, I've got this house that is so quiet, really safe. I've got all this space. I've got all this solitude. 
So I don't get to see my community, but on the other hand, I have different benefits, you know, that I can I can really value and appreciate. And just sometimes I see my mind wanting to slip off into a little bit of self-pity. Oh, other people get to go to the Dhamma talk every week, you know. And it was really interesting to see how the practice on the cushion would feed into sense restraint in my daily life almost by immediately diverting my mind away from that unwholesome path in my mind towards a different way of framing it, you know? So it's like, yes, maybe that's true, but I have so much here, you know? I remember one time having that thought just over the sink and then turning the tap on and it's like, I've got pure water just coming out of the tap. (laughs) You know, just these simple things. It's like, how can I really complain? especially when I know that people throughout the world, you know, are are suffering in so many different ways. It was probably not long before or after um, the first very abrupt lockdown in India, which basically caused thousands of people to have to walk on foot back to their villages and, you know, some dying along the way. It was really done with so little care for, for the poorest as usual, isn't it? They always take the brunt. And so, yeah, just the fact that I can turn on the tap and have water. And again, that I'm being supported. And it was giving so many people an opportunity to participate in, you know, organizing food deliveries and and uh, giving me so much joy every time a food delivery arrived. It was very beautiful because I knew that the people who were offering were getting joy from that as well. You know, another way to perceive that would be, oh, my goodness, You know, so many people are starving and I'm getting food deliveries. I don't really deserve it or, you know, it's making me feel guilty or perhaps it makes you feel that you've got to be a super duper meditator getting into all the deep states of bliss every day, getting enlightenment, stream entry, everything. You know, I could easily turn it that way, right? (laughs) Am I really worthy of this? Do I really deserve it? But no, I just realized that it makes them happy. And what will make them even happier is if I can actually gracefully, gratefully receive, you know, and use that to uplift my mind, use that to relax, to come out of this horrible um, sense of striving, you know, or sense of not being enough and just really learn to find contentment in the moment because that contentment is actually the path. The path is actually an inward movement. You know, it's not moving on to the next thing. It's actually being where we are and going more deeply inside it. And that's really only possible when we're content with where we are. It's almost like that contentment keeps our mind with our experience long enough for that experience to start to unfold. And we start to see different things happening, even in just a simple breath. If we're not content with the breath, we're thinking, oh, this is really boring. We've already started to think ahead to the next breath and the next breath. And like, how long do I have to do this? You know, just breath after breath after breath. And we forget that every breath is like a new moment of our life. Every breath is something that's just so precious, you know, especially knowing how many people are struggling to breathe you know, in whatever way, metaphorically, as a result of racism, or physically, you know, literally struggling to breathe. And here we are with this beautiful breath, every new moment of life. And so with that beautiful quality of like making peace with the breath, having loving kindness to the breath, being contented, we start to really sink into the breath. And that breath can take us to places that we don't even imagine, you know, just to places of deep peace within ourselves, all in a simple breath. And I find this practice so beautiful in that way. It doesn't take much, actually. It just takes remembering what we have rather than always sort of defaulting to what is seemingly lacking in our lives. So as I say, you know, this kind of sense restraint, it's not trying to say that one way of looking is more realistic than another, because there are many, many ways to perceive or to frame our experience. But what we do start to learn on this path is that until we're really free from the five hindrances, until we really have right view as stream winners, we're not seeing things as they truly are. We're always seeing them with bias. We're always seeing them with the hindrances, distorting, bending, twisting the truth. 
So rather than worry about what is the reality of this situation, I think it's much more helpful to come to practice and to learn to relate to life, learn to relate to our mind by asking, how can I frame this in a way or look at this in a way that leads to the wholesome states, the beautiful states arising and increasing in my heart? Because it's through those beautiful, wholesome states arising and increasing within us that, again, we are undermining the five hindrances. And the more those hindrances are undermined, the clearer our perception, the more um, close to the truth our perception is going to be. You know, it's very clear, isn't it, when we have anger arising in the mind, but we just can't see things clearly. We can't make wise decisions. Yeah. It's not to stigmatize anger. Sometimes we can even perceive so-called negative qualities that are not beautiful. We can also try to get underneath them and find some beauty in there. But the actual emotion of anger itself is quite um, unconstructive because it's just very impulsive and can lead us to make rash decisions. But even with anger, you know, sometimes it arises due to the lack of justice in the world or you know, political situations, ecocide, etc. And, you know, instead of meeting that anger with more hostility, with more of a sense of I shouldn't be feeling this way, we can actually look at it and say, okay, this hurts, this is unpleasant, this is not going to lead me um, to a beautiful state of mind. However, if I can just relate to this with compassion and actually try to understand where it's coming from, try to understand what are the values that I hold dear that are now being endangered by, for example, ecocide? You know, maybe it shows you that you actually have this deep love and appreciation of nature. You know, it shows you that you really care for the environment. You know, you want to be maybe involved in Extinction Rebellion or whatever other environmental groups, you know, some activism or supporting Greenpeace or voting green, whatever it might be. You know, you can get underneath it and find something positive even in that. And then, you know, allow that so-called negative emotion to subside. And when it subsides, then we're clearer. Then we have a much clearer idea of how to, to act. So we're transforming this suffering into compassion and even into beautiful states of mind that can be proactive rather than reactive in this world. So there are just a few thoughts and reflections. We've tried to cover the Eightfold Path from the beginning there, from right view through wise motivation or right motivation through virtue, which I touched on only fairly briefly. And then to sense restraint. And the Buddha says, you know, that when one is um, practicing virtue, he says that we, do, we experience blameless bliss within ourselves. And when we practice sense restraint, we experience what he calls um, unblemished bliss. So we're already moving towards a much more wholesome kind of happiness that might not immediately feel as enticing, as exciting, as stimulating as sensual, sensual happiness. You know, you can eat a chocolate cake or you can go and watch a, a very interesting film and it will give you a kind of rush. It will give you a hit of energy, maybe some sensual pleasure for a while. But we're turning the mind towards a different source of happiness that starts to well up from inside through our conduct, through our mind, through beautifying the mind. And he says with this aggregate of, um, of virtue, of noble virtue, we experience this bliss that is blameless. And, you know, part of that is that we have a freedom from remorse, freedom from guilt. Yeah. We also have a sense of inner integrity because our life, the way we live, is aligned to our deeper values as much as it can be. And we can always refine that further. I think it gives me a sense of confidence and stability when I know I'm living a good life. You know, sometimes I do death contemplation. In a, in a really lovely way, actually, just imagining that, you know, this were sort of I was coming to the end of my life and, and what would be the essence of my life? What would I be happy about? You know, would I feel that I'd done my best? And it makes me very pleased to think, yes, actually, I would, because despite the external conditions not always being just as I wish, the basic course of my life has been a movement from, 
you know, the coarser kind of happiness to the more wholesome happiness, from the less virtuous conduct to gradually refining my conduct. And in this sense, you know, every step that we take is a step on the path. So how can we really have regrets when we know that we're, you know, training as far as we can in wholesome states? And the Buddha said we should, um, if we're training in wholesome states, we should um, abide happy and glad. So we have to reflect that this is a really beautiful thing to do and actually allow that to gladden the mind, actually tap into that wholesome bliss because it's a subtle thing. Sometimes it can be just seen as a lack of remorse. Yeah, but other times you can feel that there is a certain sense of inner integrity, a sense of, yes, I've done what was good, you know. I've even avoided just saying a word that might have been too sharp or too unkind. And you can be glad for that. You can, you know, encourage yourself with, by reflecting on that. Not in the sense of building up the ego, but in a way that encourages you to keep on that right track. Mm -hmm. And with this bliss in the mind, when we go to meditate, the whole thing becomes so much easier. It becomes much, much easier because we already have a sense of peace, a sense of stability in our heart. Mm -hmm. So that is enough for this morning from me. And I would really like for us to do some meditation practice. So if you wish, you can just have a quick stretch uh, change your posture. Um, if you're dying for the loo, then do go and have a pee. <laughs> uh, grab some water if you wish. But we're not going to have like a proper break at this moment. You'll have a nice long lunch break later on. So just ask yourself, your body, how it would like to sit. And we'll sit for about... Uh, about half an hour or so. So I'll just wait until I see some stillness returning to my screen. Please take your time. And you might find during this settling time that the posture you've chosen is actually not the best for you. You might see someone else on their sofa and think, actually, I'd quite like to sit on my sofa, but I shouldn't do that, you know. <laughs> so just see what you think would support you best. Sometimes it is good to sit on the floor. Other times you might even want to lie down and that's fine too. Because this day is for you, not for anyone else. So just sitting and if you're comfortable to do so, closing your eyes. Perhaps briefly reflecting on all the impressions of the other people here in the virtual Zoom room supporting your practice. People you may not know much about, but people who've come with the same intentions as you. Perhaps noticing the difference between sitting alone and sitting together in a group. And I usually like to start the meditation by establishing a sense of kind awareness 
what my teacher calls kindfulness. So it's mindfulness with that extra beautiful ingredient of kindness, friendliness, warmth, benevolence. So you infuse your awareness with this friendliness. Just bringing it to the top of your head. Almost as though this kindfulness were like the light and warmth of the sun. The light of the sun illuminates what it shines upon. In the same way, mindfulness brings your experience into focus. And the kindness is like the warmth of that sun. Softening, relaxing, caressing, caring for that experience. So just allowing it to suffuse the whole body as though you're soaking up these rays of sunshine. Noticing sensations in your head, your face. neck and shoulders, at your own speed in your own time. Spreading across the chest, around the ribs, down the back, leaving no part untouched. as though you were effortlessly just absorbing the beautiful light and warmth of the sun. Your body breathing a sigh of relief. Tensions melting. Pressures draining away. through your torso, into the buttocks and legs, and down into the ground. Noticing how the ground is holding you. Encouraging you to just give Give away the tension, any unnecessary holding. Knowing you're fully supported by the earth below. Feeling all the way down into your feet, soles, the bridge of the foot and into the toes. As though your toes were soaking up the sun.
Allowing your whole body just to bask in the sunshine of kindfulness. If you wish, you can stay with this practice. Simply being present and allowing experience to unfold. Or if you wish, I'd like to invite you in some reflections. to help incline the mind towards the beautiful. So just picking up whatever works for you, whatever feels fairly natural and effortless. So just beginning with a acknowledgement, a sense of gratitude for all the things that you've left behind today. The work, the deadlines, the busyness. and recognizing the opportunity, the gift of silence, of practice that you've offered to yourself. So precious, so rare to not only have the time, the opportunity but also to recognize this as a wise thing to do. Noticing the loving kindness that you do have towards yourself. by knowing where your true benefit lies. Do you notice any uplift? Any emotional resonance in your heart?
And if you wish, I'd like to invite you to bring up your inner goodness, virtue, by recollecting something you've done for someone or for yourself that was kind, compassionate, forgiving maybe. Perhaps the time that you've offered to a friend, a listening ear, or a little service that you've done for someone, a neighbor, through your livelihood, or maybe as a volunteer. However small it seems, just recognizing that you have helped someone in some way. Notice how that recollection makes you feel. Can you tune in to the subtle happiness that arises by recognizing this quality of kindness? of virtue. And just recognizing in yourself any quality that you really value and respect. Your courage, your honesty, your willingness to make mistakes. your patience or generosity. And recognizing your wish to develop this further. What a beautiful, inspirational wish that is. It contains so much wisdom. Knowing where your benefit truly lies.
how does it feel to fully inhabit that quality? Imagining it surrounding you. Sinking deep into your heart. How does it feel to fully embody kindness or courage or generosity? And how would your life be if your thoughts, your intentions, your speech was infused with these qualities? Imagine the happiness, the joy, the beauty it would bring to your mind and to the lives of those around you. Staying present to your felt experience, relaxing with any sensations. However they manifest, Relating to any experience you have right now with these same beautiful qualities. If it helps, you can even drop the word in. Kindness. Just let the mind follow that suggestion. Resonate with the meaning of that word or another word. It captures the quality that you see in your heart and that you want to develop. Just holding the practice very gently without any effort or force.
allowing your body and mind to bask in the warmth and light of the sun. Trusting these qualities to quietly grow. as you relate wisely with kindness to whatever arises in your body and mind. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. Let's spend just a few moments really appreciating what we've just done and wishing ourselves well. May I be happy. May I be free from suffering. May I dwell with loving kindness. May I develop inner peace. May we all be happy. Free from suffering. May we all dwell with loving kindness and develop deep, unshakable inner peace. So I know the gong doesn't resonate so beautifully, but see if you can find some beauty <laughs> in the sound of the gong. <laughs> My apologies for muting myself <laughs> and uh, yeah, giving a job <laughs> to poor Sally. Sally, right? Sally? Yeah. So <laughs> thank you for letting me know. <laughs> I would have figured it out eventually, but maybe not until now. So <laughs> yeah, what you expect to happen usually happens, right? Or well, sometimes you anticipate the worst and then the best happens and you waste a lot of time. My mom told me she was spending a whole day worrying that it was going to rain and the gardeners were due to come and I'm sure it's going to rain. And then the gardeners came and it was a lovely day. She said, you see, you know how worrying and overthinking, predicting the worst can, yeah, can just cloud the mind and deprive us of the well-being and the relative peace we might have otherwise experienced. So I always think it's good to think in positive terms because even if your sort of positive perception doesn't come to fruition, your positive expectation, at least in the meantime, you've been developing a sort of inner resource. So if you are disappointed, you can deal with it. <laughs> so 
I hope you're doing okay. I see some smiles, some nods. People who don't have their video on, I won't know. So <laughs> maybe that's why you turn it off. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine to be a non. So what I thought now, we've got a few minutes before the lunch break. So I thought I'd give you just um, some tips or suggestions for some walking meditation. Um, I don't know how much time most of you need to prepare your lunch or whether you're going to fast, I hope not. I would always suggest cooking and eating meditation is part of the day. But um, I thought roughly speaking, perhaps you could take say 20 minutes or so after we part ways now to do some walking meditation before you prepare your lunch and then have a rest. We'll meet back at 1.30. So, because the theme of the day is beautifying the mind, I would suggest, again, not to force things, but just to see if you can notice the beauty in every activity that you do. So straight away, once we open our eyes for meditation, sometimes the tendency can be to lose touch with our body, to lose touch with our uh, felt sense and, and start getting pulled again by the sights and sounds around us. So see if even while you listen to these instructions, you can retain a connection to any pleasant experience of body or mind and just remain settled and centered within yourself. And then what we'll do is just take our body, take those feelings, that embodied sense into a different posture. So the walking meditation is very um, helpful for continuity of practice between meditation sessions and also before you go into more active um, practice of cooking or eating. But it's also in itself a really powerful way to develop mindfulness because there's so much more that you can be aware of. So it's especially helpful for an active mind which might need a little bit more to sort of interest it. But it's equally good for a mind that is quite calm because you notice so much going on. So see for you, depending on your mind, how much you want to bring into this, into your um, perceptual field, if you like. If you do find the mind's quite peaceful, you might want to just put your awareness in your feet and just have a fairly small area so you just notice the sensations in your feet as you walk. If your mind is a little bit restless or it needs a bit more um, to interest it, you could have your awareness in the whole of the moving part of the body, so maybe the whole of your legs, including the hips. Yeah. Sometimes we might be feeling a bit tense in our body and we feel we want more of a release and we might want to be aware of the whole body, you know, as it moves through the air and also as the feet um, fall onto the ground and move. So see what works for you. Also see where you would like to do your walking meditation. So traditionally we take an area of maybe somewhere between seven and 12 steps. Sorry, about 20 actually, seven and about 20 steps. So if it's raining where you are and you don't want to get wet or it's very cold, then see if you can find the largest room in your house with the longest sort of area, three for walking. And maybe just take, you know, a few steps. So in that case, you might want to be, you know, a little bit slower about how you walk so that you can really experience every single step. And uh, otherwise, you might want to walk outside. So I would suggest if you have a garden or a courtyard, I have a little courtyard, perhaps doing it where you feel that there's some privacy. Otherwise, sometimes there might be a field or even a park where there's a line of trees, you could just be behind it and you could just walk, maybe not super slow, but at a kind of moderate speed. Yeah, so just see how you want to adapt depending on your particular situation. So when you're doing the walking, we tend to start in one place at the end of our virtual path so we stand and as you stand just see if you can get a sense of the body rooted to the earth yeah you might want to slightly bend your knees and just bounce a few times and really feel your weight flowing down into your feet 
feeling those feet planted on the earth, yeah? feeling the sensations there. And then when you feel steadied, when you feel settled, just developing the intention to move the foot. So you might want to start with the right foot or the left foot. Notice that. Sometimes we're habituated to start with one and not the other. And then it's as though the foot's on the ground, so nicely rooted. And then you're just aware of the lifting of that foot and how the sensations tend to move into the front of the foot, the weight changes, the back of the foot feels lighter, and then it lifts. There's a different sensation there, moving through the air. And then again, settling down. Noticing which part of the foot first meets the ground. And then again, that weight, how it falls into the foot and is distributed. And when do you know that you're fully, the weight is fully in that foot? And then the next foot starts to lift. So whichever foot is lifting, see if you can have your awareness in that particular foot as it moves, as it lands, as the weight distributes. And then once all the weight's in one foot, the other foot slowly starts to move. So all your awareness goes into the other foot. And because this is a retreat about beautifying the mind, I would just suggest noticing if there's any pleasure involved in the walking meditation. You know, how does it feel just to walk? How simple can it be just to take one step? One really lovely perception, I'm not sure if it's from Thich Nhat Hanh, is to imagine your feet like kissing the earth. So as you walk, as each step falls on the earth, it's like you're blessing, you're kissing the earth. You're creating that gorgeous connection with nature. So that step can be a very gentle almost reverential step, yeah. bringing you into connection, into harmony with the earth. So any questions on that before we part? Because they're just a few reflections. You might, of course, have your own way. And there's never a right or wrong way about this. Just see if you can bring some lightness, some joy into the practice. Anything? Nothing? So, and then for the cooking and the eating meditation, see if you can notice the difference between the food choices that you make that are out of craving, perhaps out of desire or thirst. Tanha is actually literally translated as, it's, it means thirst, like the word we use for craving literally means thirst. It's that kind of, I want, I want, I want. So see if you can differentiate between that and, and what is actually going to be nourishing for you. Choices that you make out of kindness, out of compassion for your body. Sometimes it's one and the same, but sometimes there's a subtle difference. And see if you can generate some delight in making a choice that is good for you, you know. Maybe not skipping around the corners, cutting corners, right? That's the right word. Um, sometimes I think, okay, I just want to do it quickly, make something very simple, because right now I actually have to cook for myself. Normally monastics are offered food, but throughout this COVID pandemic, I've had to put food together. So sometimes I was like, I just want to do the bare minimum, you know, make it really quick. But other times I realized that was coming from a sense of impatience or even a sense of a lack of care. And it was nice to just put a bit more effort, you know, add another vegetable or take time to get, you know, the spice balance right. Something that's good for digestion, something that, you know, gets the, uh, the saliva going because it's tasty, it's appetizing. And then we digest much better. So see if you can really enjoy that process. And then when you eat the food, eating with gratitude, yeah, eating with a sense of gratitude the fact that you're able to have a full meal and satisfy your hunger, you know, and at the same time nourish your body. It's just such a precious thing. So I see there's a message. I'm just going to check. Yes. Okay. So I think the organizers are just going to say a few more words and, uh, and I will leave it there for now. So please stay in the meeting and also, yeah, if you can, um, you can turn your video off, but see if you can actually keep the meeting running. It just gives a little bit less work for the co-hosts. So I will hand over to, I think, Kate, who's going to say a few words. And we'll meet again at 1.30 in the afternoon. 
Okay, so have your lunch, have your rest and a cup of tea.